Okay, um, it's uh, two o'clock my time. I'm not sure where everyone is, but uh, wherever it is, it's probably on the hour. So let's go ahead and get started. So um, before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to first uh, remind everyone uh, that you can ask questions. If you're in the Zoom uh, webinar, you can ask questions using the Q&A function. If you're watching on YouTube, you can ask in the chat box that's to the right of the video there. Uh, and we'll collect them. And then um, June has built in a few breaks in his talk where um, I'll pass those questions on to him. Uh, that's the first thing. The other thing is I'd like to remind everyone that we do, um, we would like to solicit nominations for uh, future speakers. So all of our speakers in this series have been nominated by uh, viewers like you. So please continue to um, submit nominations. And so now uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, June Yi, who I think requires little or no introduction. Uh, full disclosure, June was my postdoc advisor, so I'm not allowed to say anything mean about him, but I wouldn't anyway. Uh, so June is a dilla -nist fellow. Uh, he did his PhD with Jan Hall at Dilla and then went on to do his postdoc uh, with Jeff, Jeff Kimball at Caltech before returning to take over Jan's labs uh, at Dilla. And um, his research uh, has been re truly remarkable. It's been sort of field opening and field leading in a number of different areas. And he has a remarkable track record of doing amazing experiments in, in a number of different subfields, including ultra cold molecules, optical lattice clocks, stable lasers, and frequency combs. Uh, and he's, as a result, he's won a number of awards, uh, too many to list here, but including the Robbie Prize, the Ramsey Prize, and the Presidential Rank Award, just to name a few. The last thing I want to highlight before I let uh, June give his talk is that he's also done a lot of community service for the AMO community and continues to do so. Uh, he's currently, I believe, chair of DAMOP and uh, was recently the co-chair of the National Academy of Sciences AMO Decadal Survey Committee, uh, which really did a big service to the whole community. And he's also now the lead PI and director of the new NSF, one of the new NSF QLCI institutes, as, uh, as well as our own board member, Dan Stemper Kern, is another lead PI um, on one of those institutes. So with that, June, we're really looking forward to your talk. Yes, Ramon. Um, it's a great pleasure to, to speak in front of the, uh, the virtual audience uh, on a sum up of the progress we have, we have made on molecules. But at first, let me thank the board of the VMAS who have done a great community service to organize these virtual talks where we can share scientific results and see each other. Um, and as some of the results I'm going to show today are actually taken during the past uh, three months or so, showing that there, there's always time to find the positive things, even despite difficult times and so on. So, so that some of the results are in fact very, very exciting. I would say, you know, what are you seeing on the screen on the right? There's this, this molecular collisional resonance induced by electric field. That's something that we have dreamed about for, I would say, two decades. And finally, it's come to fruition. We can actually see dipolars, very strong dipolar elastic interactions dominating over any elastic loss. The short message is now we can have a quantum gas of molecules that lives for 20 seconds long under a very large electrical field fully realizing the potential of tuning, building a tunable programmable machines that have strong interactions with the, with the dipolar molecules. So that's really exciting. And I hope that I will share with you in the next 15 minutes, some of those recent results. And the reason why we work on dipolar quantum systems, uh, it's coming from the fact that molecules have a tunable long range interactions. And if you put these molecules in optical lattices and so on, uh, looking at the bottom right, uh, the, the graphic, for example, we finally now can produce molecules in a degenerate form of quantum gases in these stacks of pancakes. And so, so it's a time to be able to explore the possibility of looking at the dynamics, collective physics, both intra-pancake or inter-pancake, and really gave rise to novel dynamics coming out from these long range tunable interactions. And of course, in our field, once you can control, do very precise control of these quantum systems and you can put on the tunable interactions and so on, it will give rise to opportunities in quantum metrology for quantum information sciences and, and the quantum chemistry as well. There are pioneering experiments where people have looked into the dipolar quantum systems 
using atomic magnetic dipoles in experiments in, such as in Stuttgart, in Innsbruck, and Stanford. And so is it worth it? Molecules being much more difficult system, is it worth to explore molecular dipolar systems? And I think the answer is really yes, the partly because of well, mole molecules connects to the real world, such as chemistry, in a better way. But also, if you just look at a canonical unit of dipolar strength, comparing, say, one divide of electrical dipole versus one ball magneton of magnetic dipole, the interaction strength is that much bigger by four orders of magnitude. And another really interesting point is, as I was showing in the later part of my talk, because you, the, in, the, in the lab frame, the electrical dipole moment are induced. And therefore, you can tune the strength and also the, the, the anisotropy of the dipolar interactions very easily with the electrical field. And that gives rise right, to tunable interactions in the Hamiltonian that you want to simulate or want to understand. So there are a diverse set of uh, technologies going on in our community to make cold molecules. And I'm going to focus on one particular approach where you start with atomic degenerate quantum gases, in this case, potassium-40 fermions and the lubidium-87 bosons. And then, and then you bring them together through the technique of a magneto uh, associations through the Feshbach resonance and followed with a coherent adiabatic optical transfer to the absolute ground state. And this absolute ground state molecules, in, in this case, fermionic KIB, does possess in the, in the body fixed frame of a 0 0.5 divide dipole moment. In the lab frame, of course, you have to use either electrical field or microwave field to induce that dipole moment. And this approach is now being taken by many labs uh, worldwide. And a lot of the bioalkali ultra cold polar molecules are being produced uh, in, a, in a great variety of species. And um, the typical number that dating back to the about more than 10 years ago, we, when we first produced these ultra cold polar molecules in KRB, the typical temperature is a few hundred nanocalvins, density of 10 to the 12 per centimeter cube, and it's sitting above Fermi temperature of 1.4. So it's not degenerate, so it's a thermal gas. And really took us 12 years or you know, basically a decade to get us back to TLTF of 0.3. So that factor of five turned out to be very difficult to get to this um, quantum degeneracy. But now that it does feel like the, the door is open and we can really start to explore uh, many interesting aspects of the dipolar quantum gas. So the first problem we encountered uh, back in 2008, 2010 period is is a loss, and that's the chemistry in the quantum regime. Uh, KRB and KRB, when they come together, they, uh, apparently they can undergo this exothermic uh, chemical reaction to produce potassium-2 and lubidium-2. Because these molecules have been cooled down to very low temperatures, you can use the very lowest partial waves to describe this collisional process. In this case, because they are fermions, you have to anti-symmetrize the wave function of, of, of the exchange of the two molecules, so you have the minimum angular momentum is being 1h bar, and that's so-called a P wave. Associated with the P wave, there's a P wave barrier. And it turns out there's a just very, very simple theory uh, developed by Paul Julian, John Bone, and so on, that can describe this collisional reactive loss in a very simple way, it's essentially describing the, how the molecules approach each other at the long range, and they can penetrate tunneling through the P wave barrier and have a unit of probabilities behind the P wave barrier to have a chemical reactions. And this process, threshold process, can be described by basically a couple lines of a mathematics and it beautifully describes the reaction rate that we observed. And so simply put, chemical reactions in this regime is actually very simple if you don't want, do not want to understand what's going on in the intermediate range. Uh, basically quantum statistics dictate the reaction rate and a single partial waves at a threshold will give rise to the reaction rate uh, quantitatively. When you turn on electrical field, because after all, we create a dipolar system is trying to use them. Unfortunately, as, as soon as you turn on dipolar interactions, in the original set of experiments, what you see is the molecules get lost really fast. And the reason is because attractive dipolar interactions penetrate through this P wave barrier, puncture hole, where the molecules can now uh, approach each other much easily. Uh, 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 and, and get into the short range and have chemical reaction that be lost. This problem has 
uh, persisted. You know, I would say it only really got solved uh, this year that we can now put these molecules in very large electric field and actually watch them live for 10, 20 seconds. And that's really the remarkable aspect of finally being able to solve these uh, collisional lossy, problem, lossy collisional problems. But if you look at the whole field, uh, the molecular loss apparently looks very prevalent. It's, a, it's a abundant in any system. It took another uh, 10 years for Cancunese group to start a complete new lab, building the state-of-the-art ion and uh, detection systems incorporated into quantum gas chambers. Finally, we were able, they were able to see a direct uh, potassium-2, rubidium-2 in, in reaction intermediate. And they were able to put a bound on the lifetime, actually fairly accurate measurement of the lifetime of these intermediate states. So what's, what's really nice about this is for exothermic reactions of like a KIB plus KIB, not people can have a very detailed microscopic picture of actual chemical reaction process, which is a remarkable. <clears throat> but you can also say, well, I'm going to just find molecules that's going, not going to have exosomic reaction process and they should live long, right? And here's the data coming from Da Jun Wang's group at, in Hong Kong, and they have cooled down um, sodium rubidium systems in neoquantum degeneracy. And what they see is that uh, for V equals to zero, the vibrational ground state of these molecules, the, the bimolecular reaction is su supposed to be endothermic. And so it's not energy allowed. And yet what they see, the, the loss of the molecules is just as fast as if they, if, if they put the molecules in the V equals to one uh, vibrational state where the energy will allow the reaction to take place. So it's obviously something's going on, whether it's a multi-molecular process or, or um, other, other channels opening up that causing this so-called sticky molecule model or, or whatever you want to describe. It's not completely clear why th these molecules, even though biomolecular potential would rule out exosomic reactions, nevertheless, they are reacting away. So, so this loss is a problem and we were so afraid of it we just went on and it jumped right onto making a 3D optical lattice. And as soon as you make a quantum gas of a molecule, so you just load them into, into a 3D lattice and they use 3D lattice to protect them. And indeed, here shows a very long lifetime. And the reason is obvious, every molecule is occupying one particular lattice site and either poly exclusion principle or interaction blockade mechanism will work for you to protect these molecules from reacting away. In the 3D lattice. And we like that 3D lattice approach so much that we actually took on this quantum synthesis approach where we simply build dual uh, insulators and, and make a say lubidium mod insulator and from BEC and then followed it with a potassium fermionic band insulator at the, th at the same location where the lubidium potassium are uh, occupying the same lattice sites and ideally you want one atom of each species occupying a single uh, each site. And then you go on to do magnetic and optical association. And indeed, by taking this approach, we can produce about a thousand KIV molecules in these optical lattices with a fairly good filling fraction, about 25%. The entropy is still about two KB or, um, per molecule. It's still relatively high, but it's actually enough to study uh, molecular interaction dynamics and so on inside the optical lattices. I want to highlight this experiment because this was also the experiment that Debbie Jun participated in before she passed away in 2016 and she was the pioneer of this molecular field. So one key question is that if, if these molecules are confined in individual optical lattices, what kind of interesting physics you can perform? And of course, the, the, these molecules can be encoded as qubits. You can take the lowest two rotational states with the help of opposite parity, n equals to zero and n equals to one, and, and simply encode coherence among these two uh, uh, rotational states. Because the, 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 the two rotational states uh, have opposite parity, they, they support um, body fixed dipole moment. And if you, for example, turn on an electrical field, that whether it's a DC or microwave field that resonantly drive this rotational excitation, you should be able to build this so 
um, spin half Hamiltonian in your optical lattice. And you have first you have the anisotropic interaction term, and you have the so-called Ising term. This Ising term is not there if you don't turn on the DC field. If you do not, for example, fix the orientation of the molecules with respect to the lab frame, the exchange term, where the, the molecule, the, the spin up and spin down can exchange due to the dipolar interaction, that term can exist if, as long as you have a microwave to drive the, the molecular system into coherent superposition between the two qubit, uh, between the two states of the qubit, uh, and regardless of whether you apply DC field or not. So in the first generation of experiments, because we don't, do not have a DC field, we simply explored this exchange interaction. For example, you can put these molecules in coherent superposition and do Ramsey type of experiment. And you can actually see very clearly, clearly this oscillatory term between the two neighboring molecules exchanging their spin uh, degrees of freedom through the dipolar interactions at the, at the energy scale of about 100 hertz or so. And you can also do a very quick uh, disentangling pulses because it, there's that spin exchange actually entangles neighboring, neighboring molecules, but you can also disentangle them and you can see very clearly from the Ramsey fringe contrast that the oscillatory pattern can be removed by disentangling pulses. So here I'm going to actually go on to talk about a new generation of, uh, of the JLL KIV machine. But before I do that, maybe I take a quick break here in case people have questions. Okay, so we do have a couple of questions uh, so far, primarily from the panelists. So uh, Dan Stemper-Kern asks, how much of the problem with inelastic losses of molecules is specific to alkali dimers? Are there other choices of molecules where there could be a true reaction barrier that keeps the molecules from sticking at close range? Yes, uh, no, that's an excellent question. And I would say the answer to that is probably, we don't know at, at the moment. So because the alkali atoms are the ones which, which get to such a high density uh, at a, such a low temperatures, there are other mole molecular species coming online with laser cooled molecules, calcium fluoride, strontium fluoride, uh, and actually in our lab, YO, we actually just recently loaded the YO into a dipole trap, and they are they are cooled by uh, so-called gray molasses and the Raman resonances to uh, a few microcalvin, and now they are loaded into optical dipole trap. The density starts to go high, and uh, that would be a really interesting problem to explore. What kind of um, reaction process are we going to experience when you go? Take, take the molecular sample to such a low temperatures where really only individual single partial wave need to be considered. And um, uh, uh, the density is high enough to actually look for this molecular loss process. So I don't know, Dan, the, the, the exact answer to your question, whether it's a bio specific or it's more universal. Okay, so uh, thanks. Adam Kaufman asks for the synthesis approach, uh, what's the main limitation to reaching even lower entropies? Yeah, uh, Adam, in that synthesis, quantum synthesis approach, I think what we were limited was at the time, how big a, an our optical beam didn't have enough power. So the beam was not really flat. And so when we were trying to make a lubidium uh, insulator, uh, the, the number of lubidium atoms were limited because, because of a curvature of external confining potential. If you try to try to put the two lubidium atoms in there, they start to have double layers and so on. And, 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 and so that was limiting how many molecules we could make. In terms of the question of how low the entropy can go, we actually think that the, the number we quoted 25%. After the fact, we realized that when we were trying to detect the molecules, when the atoms being flying apart, they actually, uh, uh, having some loss process. So we had too many potassium atoms there because the potassium is a fermion. It's very difficult to make a, a single layer band insulator in the middle where the lubidium band is, uh, lubidium mod insulator is located. So, so we actually just put a lot of potassium in the system and it turns out potassium is lighter, it can tunnel, they can, they can react with KIB molecules. And so we were not particularly careful that this. They are just basically itinerant potassium moving around the lattice, killing some KIV molecules. Taking that loss factor into account, and there we also found after the fact there was some uh, uh, G wave resonance in there. Uh, and and it, uh, likely the filling factor is actually 50%. But uh, when we demonstrated those experiments, we, we showed 
how many molecules we can detect. At the time, we feel comfortable to call 25% fitting fraction. So I, I do think this approach can, if you do that really well, if you really match the insulate as well, especially if the two bosonic species or two fermionic species, you might do a lot better than what we have demonstrated in the, in the 2015 work. Okay, and then maybe we'll do one more question and then you can move on. So Monica Slyer Smith asks, um, uh, in the curve where you were looking at the dipolar coupling, um, what is the main source of the contrast decay that remains after you've applied these disentangling pulses? Yeah, excellent question, Monica. That turns out the, uh, there are many, many molecules. Of course, what I was showing you in the red curve is a dominant next neighbor interactions at 100 Hertz. But it turns out there are next neighbor, next neighbor, there's a diagonal neighbor and so on. So there's actually lots of a dipolar interaction terms. Uh, some of them are 100 Hertz, some of them are 100 Hertz divided by two, some of them are 100 Hertz divided by square root of two, some of them are positive, some, some of them are negative because that's a 3D lattice. So you're adding all these terms together that actually contributes to the decay of the, of the contrast. And we have taken more systematic data, which I'm not including in this talk, that actually shows that very long decay curve of Ramsey contrast, and you can Fourier transform that and, it, and it detect many, many components of the frequency that's underlying to this decay of the contrast itself. Caden Hazard did a lot of a theory at the time when he was a postdoc with Anna Maria Ray in 2015. Okay, great. Why don't you go ahead and we'll, we'll save the rest of the qu questions for the next break. Thanks, Shimon. So, the, so, on the, so on the new machine, uh, you can see that it's a beautiful cell. And the, what's the key feature is that we now put electrodes inside the vacuum. And this is going to be key for some of the recent breakthroughs we were able to have is being able to apply very large electric field, like a 15 kilovolts per centimeter. But also you can rotate. The, the design of the electrodes is such that we can do arbitrary orientation. We can do reconfigurable gradients. and and also we incorporate a very high imaging resolution, not quite quantum gas microscope kind of a resolution, but nevertheless high resolution uh, imaging systems as well. And, and I'm going to come back and talk about these electrodes uh, in detail. But the goal, the scientific goal is to be able to produce more molecules, more than 1000, and go to lower entropy, that's Adam's question, uh, and being able to do individual control if we really want to go towards the quantum information processing uh, direction. And ideally for the quantum, even if you do the, the so-called analog quantum simulations and so on, being able to do tunable Hamiltonian will be key. So we wanted to have DC electrical fields along with microwave control and really realize the full spin half Hamiltonian with a very low entropy system. And that's really the scientific goal where this, the second generation machine was built on. So in, to address the first question about going to a much lower entropy and producing a lot more molecules, the, the key advance we made uh, in 2018, 2019 was to basically make the both rubidium potassium atoms much deeper into quantum degeneracy. Um, and, and, and because of that, this is a very different from our first generation experiments. We were able to bring both rubidium potassium deeply into quantum degeneracy, for example, potassium TLTF of 0.1 and, and, and so on. And then when you associate these into molecules, we were able to produce as many as 10 to 100,000 molecules at T TLTF of one. And if we go to the lowest TLTF, you can produce something on the, on the order of 0.3, with uh, still have about 30,000 molecules left at a temperature of 50 nanocalvin. So that was a really good step forward. To, so now we have a much larger and much denser samples of uh, KIB molecules to play with uh, in the next generation of experiments where we are going to turn on electrical fields. Maybe a, a quick slide to address the question of atom molecule thermalization process in that, in that this sort of uh, uh, association process. Because we do um, ramping up the magnetic field across the Feshbach resonance, this thermalization is actually automatic. Uh, and to just show this experiment, uh, this is where we have a KIV star representing uh, Feshbacher molecules after the first stage of magneto association. And you can, you can uh, after you produce these KIV Feshbacher molecules, you can remove all the remaining rubidium 
And in fact, the conversion efficiency is very high. We don't have them, that many remaining rubidium, but remove that by resonant light. And then you can excite center of mass oscillations of the molecules in, inside the dipole trap, but keep the potassium cold. And you can actually watch how they thermalize. For example, here shows uh, if you don't have any potassium in the system, the KRV molecules start to oscillate back and forth in the dipole trap. As you increase the density of the potassium, gradually, you can see the, damp the oscillation damps away very quickly. We, can, we have also done direct temperature thermometer measurement of the KRV temperature versus potassium temperature and watching them re-thermalize together very quickly. And this experiment, uh, similarly in, in um, MIT, by the group of Wolfgang Kedley and uh, Alan Jamison, they have shown uh, in this particular nature paper that they were able to use rubidium, uh, sorry, sodium atoms to sympathetically cool sodium lithium molecules down and the very similar sort of atom molecule thermalization process that's going on. <laughs> we can also very quickly uh, using the so-called density fluctuation suppression technique to characterize the Fermi degeneracy. As we know uh, in, in, in a Fermi Dirac distribution near the center, the density fluctuation is suppressed uh, due to the, the Fermi statistics. And while thermal gas in the wings will have a uh, larger fluctuation, which is a, the variance would be about equal to the mean. Uh, so, so you can take an image, uh, absorption image like this and fit with the Fermi Dirac distribution, which get, allow you to get the mean number of molecules uh, across this crowd. And then also measure the fluctuations of the density variations. And, and the, plot them together, you will see that indeed, as, you, as a, you get into the quantum degeneracy towards the center of the crowd where the most of the molecules are uh, uh, concentrated, the density fluctuation is, is now suppressed below the thermal uh, statistics. So what about our old friend of uh, chemistry near absolute zero? So this was actually the data taken by Silka, Ospelkus, and Conquin and so on back in 2010, 10 years ago with the TLTF of 1.4, the thermal gas. What you see is, a, is this P wave loss process where the molecules tunnel back behind the spare P wave barrier and have loss. And if you plot the so-called loss coefficient, the, the reaction rate coefficient beta as a function of temperature, you see this linear slope. And if you plot beta as divided by T, you see a constant that's 1.2 times 10 to minus five centimeter cube per second per Kelvin. And it's very close to the MQDT prediction, which is a 0 0.8. So we decided to re redo this experiment uh, recently. And what we found is uh, really quite interesting uh, that when T over TF is greater than 0 0.6, we see this, the same thing, the beta over T is a constant hovering around one. And when T over TF is less than 0 0.6, when you get into the quantum degeneracy, you actually see further suppression of the reaction, uh, the beta over T number comes down by a factor of four, so three or four. So this is a kind of a new regime of chemical reaction in a degenerate Fermi gas, where at, in, when it's thermal, it looks like a beta over T agrees with the MQDT theory remarkably well at, at a 0 0.8, uh, 10 to minus five centimeter cube per second per Kelvin. But when, when, when you get into the quantum de degeneracy, there's a mechanism which is actually suppressing the loss. Not a significant factor, but, but a three or four. And there are a couple of theory papers recently appeared on the archive, one from Chi Zhou's group um, at Purdue, who, who's now introducing the P-wave contact concept in a reactive loss, in, in a lossy uh, quantum gas. The other is by Anna Maria Ray's group. Uh, they are trying to go through the Conquinese discovery of intermediate reactive uh, intermediate states. And, and, and MRS group has done calculations to show if, the, if there are other molecules lying around in uh, at the intermediate states and there's a conversion factor, there is a lossy factor and there could be a Zeno effect at play when there are so many molecules near each other. Um, and this could provide this counterintuitive loss suppression mechanism in the quantum degeneracy. But we moved on to put these uh, very dense samples of molecules under electric field. So this field configuration is actually described in very uh, much detail in Jacob 
Jake Colby's PhD thesis. He graduated in 2017. Actually, in fact, Jake just became a professor at uh, University of Illinois, so very close to you, Shimon. Uh, I heard you guys are going to do collaborations. Uh, but he described this very detailed electrical field uh, characterization and configuration, but he unfortunately never got to enjoy it. You know, he moved on to become a postdoc at Caltech working with Manuel uh, on, on tweezers of strontium. But, and so all power to him. But he left us with a very great device of all these electrical field. And a recent work, uh, that actually, this is the Giacomo Valtellina's paper that we put on the archive recently. We have a very, uh, pretty much now using this, the capability of the electrical field to allow us to do uh, dipolar evaporations. And also the resonance that I'm going to tell you about is also enabled by this very precise control of the DC electrical field. We can control both the angular orientation as well as the precise value of it. Uh, down to about 100 parts per million. Another really important feature is we can control the gradient and the curvature of the electrical field very precisely. Um, the experimental setup gives us this, a cell gives us enough uh, capabilities putting lots of beam through and these green, red beams are various different cross dipole traps as well as accordion lattice, as well as a real scientific lattice and so on. And I'm going to go through that a little bit later, but just giving you a picture of the general experimental setup. To the left is actually a picture of uh, images of the molecules loaded into these individual scientific lattice pancakes. And we don't have in situ imaging capabilities to see molecules spaced apart by 500 nanometer. That's basically the spacing between these lattices. But we can use the technique of uh, by using momentum sp uh, space imaging technique, we can actually see these individual pancakes very well in time of flight. So the theorists, uh, many of our theoretical colleagues have thought about dipolar physics, of course, a long time ago. And in particular, they feel for molecules, a way to solve these reactive problems, but also lots of interesting physics is happening in a 2D. Um, and in particular, I'm showing you a, a figure that was calculated by uh, Gouvan, Kermenier, and John Bond that showed as a function of electrical field or the function of induced dipole moment, the rate coefficient of elastic collision and inelastic collision can be controlled. You know, you look, notice the red curve is for the elastic uh, rate coefficient. And you can see this over, it's being changed from zero dipole moment to 0 0.3 Debye uh, dipole moment and the rate coefficient is changing over four orders of magnitude. While the loss coefficient, the, the, the re reactive loss process can be, can be actually suppressed. And, and, and so if you can really do that, you can, you're giving yourself potentially elastic over inelastic collision uh, ratio in, in a favorable way by a factor of 100 or more. And this is exactly what we were not able to achieve. <coughs> and because of that, we can, we can see a strong suppression of chemical reactions in 2D. We can look at it crossover from 3D to 2D physics. Uh, elastic interaction now far dominates of inelastic loss. And that allowed us to do dipolar evaporative cooling and to get into the onset of a quantum degeneracy in the 2D gas, and also allow us to see dipole mediated collision resonance. So let's first talk about suppression of inelastic loss in 2D. Uh, if, if by, by confining them along this direction uh, of strongly confining, actually we make a lattice frequency about 15 kilohertz, 20 kilohertz or so in the, in the direction where the electrical field is, 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 uh, is applied. And you can see that uh, for an induced dipole moment of a 0.2 divide, according to the, those theory calculations, you should have elastic of inelastic ratio to be about 100. What we first can see is that for the inelastic part, indeed the molecule live longer. This is over 10 seconds, and this is two body loss rate uh, decay curve. And if we plot curves like this, this is taken at a 0 0.2 divide as a function of the dipole moment, and you arrive at it at, at a function of the, the two body loss coefficient as a function of the dipole moment looks like this. And you notice that compared to the zero dipole moment case, you can, by tuning on the electrical field and induce the dipole moment at 0.2 divide, 
you can suppress this chemical reaction by a factor of, um, uh, this is in this particular case, two or three uh, and, and so on. Uh, so it's not, not great, but remember, as long as we can hold the loss to be steady and not running away like we have shown in the 3D gas, at the same time, going from zero dipole moment to 0.2 divide dipole moment, the elastic interaction is ramping up by three or four orders of magnitude, then we will win. The other interesting data to show really fast is the crossover from 3D to 2D. If you hold yourself at a static electric field, suppose this is a five kilovolts per centimeter, giving you a dipole moment about 0.2 divide in that range. As we ramp up the confinement frequency along this tight confining direction that we call Y, omega Y is the harmonic confinement frequency in that direction. As you can see that when, the, when omega Y is ramped up from zero, uh, to seven kilohertz, you can see the loss rate comes down dramatically uh, to near zero, near that suppressed region. The reason why there's a, this kink or this knee here is because by the time you reach seven kilohertz, the molecules, which are 250, 300 nanocalvin or so in this particular case, now you can see there are most of the molecules now occupying the lowest band in this, in this Y direction. And that means the molecule now can only collide with each other in the, in the transverse direction, which you, you have, if you consider a P wave, it has one H bar unit of angular momentum. Now the two projections are plus minus one H bar angular momentum, they are doing the collision. And that collision is, a, is so-called a side-to-side side -side dipolar collision that's repulsive and that's protecting yourself from the reactive loss. Another uh, really interesting feature about 2D systems is even if you still have loss going on, um, it does not give rise to the so-called anti-evaporation heating. And the, the heating rate, in fact, also goes down to zero. So, th so this is something we can characterize sort of a 3D to 2D crossover by just simply confining molecules into a deeper um, lattice along the direction of the Y axis. So the, another question I need to answer is, okay, now you can you can remove away the the loss process. What about uh, what about the dipolar uh, elastic part of the interactions? So we can use dipolar thermalization measurement to characterize the the dipolar collisional cross section. So what do we do is we actually uh, you have these pancakes, you can squeeze in one direction, for example, in this case, along Z, and then watch the temperature rise in the X direction and see if the dipoles are, dipolar molecules are interacting with each other strongly, then the temperature should equilibrate very quickly from one axis to the other. And this is indeed what we were able to show as you go from dipole moment of a 0.1 divide to 0.2 divide, the thermalization, the cross-dimensional thermalization time scale gets much shorter. And again, you can plot this systematically as a function of the dipole moment on the right. And you can see the thermalization rate once you pass the 0.1 divide is going up as a function of the roughly about d to the three um, power for the thermalization. And if you do a very quick back of the envelope calculation from the rate uh, from the thermalization rate to the collisional rate, making assumption of how many collisions were needed to do the thermalization. You can actually see the data, experimental data, roughly lies on the theory predictions that John Bone and Gouvan Kumenea made 10 years ago. And that's really giving us this hope that, that we are getting into this regime of 100 times bigger elastic interactions over inelastic losses. And maybe that's time to do uh, evaporative cooling experiment. <laughs> to do evaporation experiment, we need to control the trapping potential with electrical field. And the first thing we need to do is actually characterize the trap itself. As you turn up the electrical field to 10 kilovolts per centimeter and so on, you will polarize these molecules. In fact, they will change the polarizability of molecules in sitting inside the dipole trap compared to zero field case. And indeed that we can just do very careful measurements. Svetlana uh, Kotochkova has done uh, in uh, sort of uh, ab initial calculations of KRB, how the polarizability changes with a, both the AC field and DC field on with different orientations uh, for polar, uh, polarizations and so on. So we have 
very strong theory support from her. And it, in fact, uh, measurement theory agree remarkably well in most cases. So this allows us to characterize what is the trapping frequency under what electrical field, under what laser field that you're applying uh, at the same time. The second uh, tool set we have is if you look at the six electrodes, we can apply, if you turn, if you do not turn on these rods, you can apply parallel electrical field, a mostly uniform electrical field in the direction of Y. But if you turn on the rods, you can actually rotate the electrical field. You can also turn on the rods such that you can change the gradient or curvature of the electrical field where the molecules in the middle will experience. And that's what it, what's shown here. Uh, you know, you see a canonical looking uh, optical dipole charging charge potential before you turn on the rods. But as you turn on the rods to a certain uh, voltage scale, you can start to bend along the X direction and, and that, that allow you to have hot molecules to spill out. And you can actually characterize the whole thing by just looking at the radial trapping frequency along this direction of X as a function of the voltage you apply to the rods. And this allow you to really scale uh, with a fairly detailed control and the theory and experimental understanding of how the electrical field is shaping the, the, the optical dipole trapping potential for these molecules. And this is all necessary knowledge for us to be able to do evaporation. Another interesting um, uh, prerequisite to be able to, to really understand the, the evaporation data is to understand how many molecules are loaded into how many pancakes or how many layers of 2D traps. So we started with this optical dipole trap and we, start, we actually first load into a very large spacing lattice, 10 micron. And this is done by just having two side beams coming in and interfere. And that's, this is very easy to do because the 10 micron spacing is so large that you essentially all the molecules are being now loaded into a particular lattice layer. And this is a very large spacing lattice. And we, we, it's not our science, science lattice. This is the lattice which basically doing the transition here. Now, once we have molecules in the single layer of this large spacing lattice, then we want to load into the science lattice that we want to do evaporations and so on. And that's the 540 nanometer lattice. The 540 nanometers referring to the, the spacing of the, of the lattice between these, the green pancakes. So how, once you load these atoms into those lattices, how do you measure? We can no longer do in situ imaging. We don't have that resolution to see 540 nanometers in real space. But what we do is do this um, the trick by transferring the information from spatial dimensional uh, distribution to the to the momentum distribution, which is you know, this lattice is confined in an optical dipole trap. So because these lattice have a vertical direction, uh, they are vertically spaced apart. They have a different potential energy with respect to the optical dipole trap. If you let them go, if you turn off the lattice, but don't turn off the dipole trap and you wait for a quarter cycle of the optical dipole trap oscillations, the information in the original spatial distribution turns into momentum distribution. It's essentially just a phase space rotation by a quarter of period. So now the information is buried in the PY, in the momentum along Y direction, and you just let them fly apart. And you can easily see, okay, these molecules are, are occupying seven layers, or these molecules are occupying four layers, and so on. So that gives you the confidence we know how many molecules are occupying where. And now we can go on and measuring the temperatures and so on and do, start to do evaporation. So the evaporation process starts with first creating 2D molecules, put them into these layers, ramp up the electrical field, and then start to increase anti-curvature by the electrical field uh, gradient to decrease the trap depth. What's the criterion for good evaporation? Well, you know that the loss of the particles should be slow compared to the loss of the temperatures according to the criteria of whether you're doing this evaporation in 3D or 2D and so on. In the 2D case, you want this uh, the, the power of N versus the power of T to be less than two. And you can actually see that uh, we are doing a very efficient evaporation. The slope is actually one, meaning the, the number of molecules being lost as the temperatures are lowering down is, is being decreased is actually much slower than what's, what's being indicated as a dashed curve, which has a slope of two. The slope of two would indicate in the two dimensions, 
you do not have enhancement of phase space density, but we are well above uh, that dashed curve, so indicating we are actually increasing phase space density quite efficiently using evaporation with dipole assisted force. So this, again, it's probably not a surprise if you plot the slope, this efficiency of evaporation as a function of the dipole moment or the function of the electrical field, you can see that it gets the most efficient uh, when the, the elastic over inelastic ratio reaches over 100. And that you can see over quite a, a range of electrical field, we can see the slope be below two uh, and, and uh, in all, anything below two indicating a rise of the phase space density. And so you can take images between the thermal gas or degenerate gas. Uh, if you plot their line profile, uh, integrated OD, you can see when, when T over TF is two, you can fit with a Gaussian profile. But when T over TF is 0.8, uh, the Gaussian profile would overshoot the middle uh, where the, the Fermi energy starts to turn on, Fermi statistics, statistics starts to play. And you have to use the full Fermi direct distribution to fit it. And as you know, as early as 1999, when Debbie and Brian DiMarco was, was first uh, characterizing Fermi degeneracy, they, they taught us the trick of, uh, you can actually look at the energy deviations between classical energy, which is temperature, versus the Fermi energy, which you can either fit by uh, the direct Fermi direct distribution, or you can, you can fit from the, just to taking the wings and the, and the fit with the Gaussian, and you can actually see how the Gaussian overshoots the middle and estimate the energy difference between the, um, the, the, the Fermi degeneracy and the Fermi energy and, and the classical energy that's given by the temperatures. And both techniques gave rise to this indication of as you go to TLTF from 2 to 0 0.6, there's a, a clear deviation of the energy scale between the Fermi degeneracy and the thermal gas. Um, there are two sets of um, lines here. The solid line is actually for 2D and the dashed line is for 3D. It, it, it's for 2D, you can see the quantum degeneracy signature is more, appears earlier than in 3D, where uh, you know, even at a TLTF of 1.0, you can start to see the curve gaining up. And that's because of in 2D, you have, a, you have a smaller density of states than in 3D. That's why the quantum degeneracy is more apparent in 3D. With a Fermi gas. Well, I'm going to now, uh, the last topic I want to tell you about is uh, the resonance, which is a, is a very, very new observation. But before I do that, maybe it's a good time to for, for another quick stop for questions. Yeah, we've built up uh, quite a few. So um, Aruku Senu, who's an, an undergrad, who's one of our most reliable uh, attendees to these talks and asks a lot of questions which we really appreciate, asks, um, can you connect uh, these experiments that you're telling us about now to the spin exchange experiments in the 3D lattice that you told us about in the previous section? So are spin exchange interactions present here and how, how do you understand the connection between the two? The spin exchange connect, uh, interaction is not present here. That's because, uh, well, I shouldn't say it's not a present here. The spin exchange interaction is down in the optical 3D lattice where molecules are individually confined in the lattice site. And then we use microwave field to put the molecules in coherent superposition between rotational ground state and first rotational excited states. And then we watch how the neighboring molecules start to spin exchange back and forth. In the current set of experiments, these molecules are actually in a gas. Uh, they are, there's no lattice, well, except that it's, you can call it a one dimensional lattice where there's, there's a stack of pancakes and the molecules live there. Each, each, each pancake now holds a Fermi seed. And, and these, these molecules are interacting with each other. They are running into each other. There's no lattice to confine them in the emotional degrees of freedom. So they can, they can much more freely run into each other. They, that's why they can have chemical reactions. You, you, we haven't used a rotational field to put them in coherent superposition yet. This is all down by DC electrical field. And, and so, yeah, so in some sense, we haven't really characterized the coherence of the system, the way spin exchange is necessary dealing with the coherence of a position. So that's the rough answer. Great, thanks. So then both uh, Aruku and our uh, panelist, Christy Chu, ask, um, can you explain why both the two-body loss coefficient 
uh, it sort of has a threshold and increases above a dipole moment of 0.2 Dubai. And similarly, why does the thermalization rate not increase until 0.1 Dubai? Um, and is it just consistent with being flat there or is there actually physics going on before 0.1 Dubai? Yes, the, the uh, excellent observation. Before 0.1 Dubai, there's some thermalization there, but that thermalization is a background thermalization. Essentially, you can think of that as, well, if your trap is not fully um, uh, orthogonal, it, it, that there is a cross coupling between the, the two directions and they can, it, they can appear to be a thermalization, but that's not a real true thermalization. So in some sense, you have this dashed line that we showed here, that that's a sort of a background, how well we can measure thermalization uh, above this background, uh, the data above this background is, is the one we are, we are showing as a dipolar dependence, but below it. And, and in fact, there's a point, we, it's a, a special point, which is a filled circle. It's actually, this data is actually taken at a dipole moment of zero, but because it's a log scale, dipole moment of zero is hard to represent. So we put it, we placed it here arbitrarily, but we have a clear uh, specification that this data is taken with a zero dipole moment indicating that even at a zero dipole moment, there was, which is not supposed to have thermalization, there's some background thermalization that could be apparent thermalization due to the trap distortion. But the first question, however, I, I don't remember, what was the first question? Uh, so it was a similar, similar question, uh, but for the two body loss coefficient, you, you, there's a sort of similar threshold that occurs above 0.2 Dubai. There you go. Uh, two yeah. body lock. Is, is, are you talking about this particular curve here? Yeah. Or? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. And yeah. um, so this is actually uh, as initially the the uh, uh, the loss rate is being suppressed as you turn on electrical field coming, to, and then it goes back up. Why did it go back up? Yeah. So that's a. In fact, the, the going back up is a fully predicted by theory. The reason being that the confinement along the vertical direction, along this uh, y direction, is not strong enough. If you are truly in a 2D where the say the confinement frequency is so strong that the dipolar length, or the sorry, the harmonic length itself, which is a harmonic wave uh, wave function uh, that can extend it over the direction in the vertical direction, these individual 2D traps. If you make that dimension so small, that's smaller than the dipolar length, where the molecules truly can no longer jump over each other, then you can actually see the suppression all the way. But because the finite confinement frequency we have, 15 kilohertz, 14 kilohertz, and so on, as you turn up electrical field large enough, the dipole dipole interaction becomes so strong, and you don't have enough confinement energy to keep them in the truly 2D, so they can still rise up. And that's a problem in some sense we will solve later with the molecular resonance. Does that answer the question? Um, I think so, yeah, thanks. So then uh, Wolfgang Ketterly asks, why do you evaporate with an electric field anti-curvature and not via a gradient uh, tilt evaporation? Okay, yeah, so Wolfgang, we actually started it with a gradient first uh, and basically tilting it. Uh, what, what Wolfgang is asking is why, why don't you just tilt the trap, right? And that would be the gradient. Uh, and what we found is that with gradient, the efficiency is not as good as when you actually bend over, it's like a potato chip just bends over. And turns, maybe this is because you have two directions for the molecules to come out. Then the gradient would be only one direction for molecules to come out. So, so experimentally, we found this gradient, give, uh, sorry, the, the curvature gives rise to a better efficiency. Okay, and then uh, Xing Wu asks, how strong is the requirement on the initial temperature of the molecules to start these evaporations? Um, so let's say would a few samples of, uh, a few microkelvin sample of YO or uh, calcium fluoride in optical lattice be good enough to start? Yeah, well, I think one's got to try. I mean, in some sense, uh, you know, we certainly created a good condition for ourselves where we were able to have, uh, very, very high density samples in 3D. And then when we subdivide it into a finite number of pancakes, we really put a lot of effort to try to use as lower number of pancakes as possible. So you can have as large number of molecules jammed into a particular pancake to uh, increase the evaporation efficiency. But I think um, 
um, if you don't have that, it's it's it, you know once you can achieve this good elastic in elastic collision law process, you may not reach as low a uh, TL or TF number or, or BEC number, but nevertheless will will give you evaporation, right? You know, once you have elastic in elastic ratio to exceed it in, in this uh, very favorable condition. <coughs> Okay, great. So I think, um, why don't we let you uh, go on with your talk? There's a few more questions we'll save for the end, but yeah. So Shimon, basically I have five minutes left. Is that correct? That's perfect. That's that's great. Okay. So so the last part is actually quite quite exciting as well. You know, what we I showed you so far is electrical field is perpendicular to these pancakes, showing you that the projection of the angular momentum is in the plus minus one regime that was a P wave. But what if you actually start to rotate the electrical field? Um, the quantization axis will be with respect to the electrical field because the electrical field is so strong defining the, the dipole uh, moment, induced dipole moment in the lab frame. What if you actually rotate the electrical field all the way to be parallel with the plane? Now here is actually the worst case scenario you would be very worried about because they are, you have had to tell collisions that will give rise to the M equals to zero component of the collision that would give rise to the loss. Remember the picture that I showed from 10 years ago where you have an electrical field, you penetrate through the, the P wave uh, barrier and it will have a loss of loss. But what we want to do this is because this allows you to actually very nicely measure the, the P wave components, the M equals to one contribution, M equals to zero contribution and so on. And by rotating the electrical field orientation with respect to the pancake direction, you can, for example, at zero degree, you, you see the contribution comes from purely M equals to plus minus one because M equals to zero is a fully, uh, is, is a removed unless you go to very, very large electrical field where it gets rise again. But as you go to 90 degree, there's an equal contribution of both M equals to zero and M equals to plus minus one. So we just did those measurements and indeed you can see there's a order of magnitude difference if the electrical field is perpendicular to the pancake or parallel to the pancake. Well, when the electrical field is parallel to the pancake, the, the loss rate goes up by, by about a factor of 10. And then we start to look into the controlling molecular energy with electrical field. Um, you know, this is on the right is a, the rotational ladder of a typical uh, molecule. So we start with a ground state and equal to zero. You can use a microwave. And this is a question earlier somebody asked about turning on coherence. So you can use a microwave to put yourself in coherence of position or put the entire population in N equals to one. You can actually drive to the one minus one or one plus one or one zero. These are the internal angular momentum projections of the rotational states. With electrical field, there is degeneracy is lifted. So you can actually, even with our very good control of polarization of the microwave, you can still put the population fully in the one equals to one zero. Now, if you turn up the electrical field further, on the right-hand side, when the field is, is zero, you can see the N equals to spacing is, is a much larger than N equals to zero to one, right? That's a typical rotational ladder. But if you apply enough uh, sufficiently large electrical field, N equals to zero is a so-called weak field seeking state. So is N equals to two. But n equals to one is actually a, oh, so sorry, I misspoke. N equals to zero and two are the strong, strong field seeking states. N equals to one is a weak field seeking state. And so that means n equals to one energy is bending up, while two and zero is bending down. Eventually, you can see that energy scale becomes the same. From zero to one and one to two, you could get into a situation where one zero plus one zero molecules equal to the energy of zero zero plus two zero or even one zero plus one zero equal to zero zero plus two plus minus one. And this is a really interesting regime, right? You, see, you can start to see there's energy degeneracy. Maybe two molecules prepared in one zero states, when they come together, they could have given rise one molecule go to zero zero, the other molecule go to two zero. And that would be totally angular momentum is also conserved, energy is conserved. The so, so is the situation uh, in this case of you prepare two molecules, one zero and one zero, and they collide and one molecule go to zero, zero, the other molecule go to two plus minus one, two plus one or two minus one. Where does the extra momentum come from, angular momentum? Well, that comes from the fact the two molecules are rotating with each other, there's a P wave. 
there's m equals to one component that you can borrow an angular momentum from orbital uh, when the two molecules are orbiting around each other and then borrow that angular momentum and put this into the internal rotational state. So these are the interesting kind of resonance we can start to explore by turning electrical field up to 15, 14, 12 kilovolts per centimeter. And if you draw the picture of the stock energy as a function of electrical field, you can see indeed these are the two crossings I'm talking about, one zero versus two zero zero two minus one or zero zero two zero. But if we zoom in, well, these molecules can have a dipolar interactions. Now it goes back to that question. Now how you connect the dipolar exchange from the early work we did in 3D lattice versus now in this bulk gas, it's the same dipolar exchange at play here. Now these energies are degenerate, but the molecules zero, zero to one zero as they flip, there's a dipole moment. And so is a one zero to two zero. So you could be doing this kind of flipping process and that gives rise to a very strong dipolar coupling that gives rise to this avoid crossing when the two energy are degenerate. That means it's possible that you will be getting into the Van der Waals regime where the, uh, the dipolar interactions start to be appreciable that you can have energy barriers because the 1010 is sitting above the 0020. So the avoid crossing will push energy further up. Or on the left-hand side, on the other hand, the 1010 sitting below that energy bear, uh, of the 0020. So the resonance is going to push the energy down. So as a function of the distance between the two molecules, you start to see a very rapidly rising uh, Van der Waals potential due to the dipolar resonant dipolar interactions. Well, what's the consequence in the, in the experiment? I'll we'll try to finish this quickly. Uh, you will see that on either side of the resonance, you will see very, very long lifetime indicated by the, the yellow circles. Out to 20 seconds, we still see the molecules. Or you can see extremely short lifetime and th their difference can be like a factor of three orders of magnitude. And, and the, this happens with just about, about uh, zero, 1% change of electrical field. You change electrical field from 12.5 kilovolts per centimeter to 12.67 kilovolts per centimeter. Totally different behavior. And this is because now that you can use electrical field to actually shield if you take it, take this upper curve by tuning electrical field to 12.67 kilovolts per centimeter, you are now shielding against the collisional loss. And you can see really sharp resonances. Uh, you know, the loss is in fact being modulated by three orders of magnitude of a very sharp uh, range of electrical field about few, two, two or uh, 100 kilovolts per centimeter, two, 200 volts per centimeter, sorry. Um, and you, you can actually scan across the entire range of the electrical field. There's actually the background curves are also quite interesting that tells you about this dipolar suppression or enhancement of the loss as you rotate the angle of the electrical field, but the resonance nevertheless appears at the same place because it comes from the same field cross, um, energy crossing. I want to give credit to Guvan Kruminer. The solid curve is a good, honest, no free parameter scattering theory calculation. That's what's really more remarkable is he did this calculation five years ago. We just happened to throw his curve on top of the data. It's just right on, no fitting. It's, a, it's just amazing actually, you know, because we can characterize the electrical field so well that these just resonance just comes right out. Um, and this showing this dipolar interaction produces avoid crossing is actually universal. This works for both m equals to zero and m equals to plus or minus one channels, meaning that the shielding actually works in 3D gas. You don't need a 2D gas at all. And we have experimentally probed this preliminary in the lab. Indeed, in the 3D gas, you turn on the electrical field, this value, the molecule live long. So this is really exciting because the shielding is actually work that any reactive molecules now can actually be solved. It can have a long lived quantum gas of molecules. Okay, summarizing it. I think um, we have shown a really interesting development where tunable dominant elastic interactions start to play a big role. And that would allow you to do evaporative cooling, that allow you to probe uh, long lifetimes and then you can use dipoles to mediate collisional resonances. And so 
So we start to have these gases at, in the laboratory that can start to explore interesting many body physics. With that, I want to thank uh, the group members, Kai Matsuda, Kai, uh, Kyle Matsuda and Will Tobias are the two graduate students, um, came from CUA uh, four years ago. Jun Lu is also from CUA, Jun Lu is from Wolfgang Kedley's uh, group. Uh, Giacomo and Luigi are the two, also two senior postdocs who have been with the group for four years now. Um, and I think uh, we also want to thank uh, many theory collaborators for, for collaboration on these experiments. So the experimental process has taken, you know, over more than a decade, but I think it's actually getting exciting, really exciting again. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, June, for an excellent talk. So uh, we do have a few more questions. And then after that, we can uh, transition to the discussion session where people can continue asking questions in a more informal and not recorded uh, sort of uh, format. So um, uh, Mehdi Hassan asks, in the molecular resonance part where you rotate the direction of electric field instead of fixing the direction of the quantization axis, if you dynamically rotate the direction of electric field, does it help to mitigate the loss due to head-on collisions? And then actually our own panelist, Aziza Sulemanzade, had a similar question, which is, are there potential benefits for applying more complex or time-dependent electric field patterns? Yeah, I mean, these are all excellent questions. So we haven't had a, yes, it, it, you know, in fact, you notice that I only told you about inelastic, you know, the collisional resonance is only measuring in the loss parameter. We haven't explored the elastic part. I think that would be really interesting things to explore around this resonance. What if you stress the uh, atoms up with a microwave? Or what if you actually study the, the thermalization rate? Uh, and, and so there's a, a number of questions uh, that, that we just haven't had a chance to explore. Uh, and, and I think the, the, the way that you say it would turn on the electrical field with different time dependence, um, that could be could be quite interesting. Uh, it's just something that is so new we haven't had a chance to really explore them yet. But actually, if you have a good suggestions, do write write us email. We'll, we'll, we'll consider them all. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new playground with that. So uh, Wolfgang asks, uh, does the shielding work only in a rotationally excited state? Okay. Yes. At the moment, the that, that, that's right. So Wolfgang, the only thing that we can uh, we can answer is that n equals to one. So this shielding is working with n equals to one molecules right now. Um, but I could imagine you could go to n equals. I mean, this is something actually I, sh I should point out. This is something similar to what people have done in the Rydberg atoms. They call it Foster resonance, where you can prepare a particular at atomic state. And then uh, when the two atoms come to be close together, one can go to lower orbital, the other one go to high orbital. So I would imagine there could be different rotational states. This can, can work. Of course, dipole moment gets smaller and smaller as you go up further. Um, but it, it actually gives rise to a really interesting scenario that you can, and n equals to one, the shielding is working really well and it's long lived, but the dipole interaction is not that strong, right? n equals to one, the dipole, even at a 15 kilovolts per centimeter, the dipole moment is only 0.15 divide. But you can actually momentarily jump to the n equals to zero to do some gate operations, for example. n equals to zero, you have a full dipole moment on. So that means you could actually get, get yourself into very strong interacting for a moment and come back in a sort of a, in a shielded regime and go out to do some dynamics. And those are the things we start to be thinking about, uh, how, to, how to take advantage of these long lived base sets and then go out there to, to strong interaction, almost like a readable physics now. So of course, I think that actually much smaller. Uh, that leads very nicely into um, a question from Ivan Deutsch, um, which is, so what particular physics do you hope to explore with analog quantum simulation in, in this system? And similarly, what special features can you capitalize on for quantum computing in this system? <laughs> Well, uh, if, if, if you want to do quantum computing, I think the, the key thing that we must have is being able to address individual molecules. <laughs> we don't have that capability right now. Um, you know, we can, 
individually resolve individual pancakes and so on, but that's still not in situ going in. I, I think uh, having capabilities like quantum gas microscope will be will be really important in the future when we can go in and individual oh, tweezer is another possibility. But what I worry about tweezer is the distance is far. So for Rydberg atom, tweezer is, is quite nice because Rydberg dipole moment is so strong. But for polar molecules, they still like to be close together to have to enjoy that kind of interaction. So we are still exploring how do you really be able to do quantum computing aspect of using molecules where you have to have individual addressability. We have now tunability in here with electric field. Um, so analog uh, and simulations, I think it will be powerful in terms of you write down the full spin half Hamiltonian in three dimensional lattice. For example, this is going back to the early days uh, I showed this spin exchange. But now with this quantum gas experiment, the filling fraction, fraction can be much higher and there we can actually study the spin diffusion problems, uh, spin uh, localization problems, maybe maybe exciton condensation problems, you know, study a line of spin rotation, excitation, and see how they permeate or localize. That I think we have now a full range of capabilities because we can adjust both DC field and C fields and so on, and with very high filling. Okay, so maybe we'll do one more question and then uh, we can save the rest of the questions for the informal discussion with June. Um, so this is going back to earlier in your talk. Um, Timor Ch Cherbel, who just joined our panel uh, and the board, asks, uh, in the potassium KRB thermalization experiments, did you also observe thermalization of internal degrees of freedom of KRB, such as vibrational uh, modes? Oh, um, yeah, this is going to the... This is quite quite a bit earlier in the talk. I I, I was uh, biased towards not panelists for most of the questions, but I thought it was. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically, I think in uh, Timo, in this particular experiment, the KRB is uh, is always in the, in fact, we do not want internal state to be thermalized because that would be really bad for us. <laughs> so, we, so we want internal states to be staying put in a single pure quantum state and then externally you want to thermalize. So then they are taking on this low entropy of, uh, of atomic um, gas. So, so I think that's the case that internal states actually is robust. I think in Wolfgang's experiment uh, in this paper that I showed the uh, sodium colliding with sodium lithium, I think it's the same thing that you want to protect the internal state by using thermalization to cool down the external degrees of freedom. Right, except that in your, in your case, there is a lot, the molecule is very large, right? And yeah, so just moving. Yeah. Um, thanks. Okay, we so don't, we don't let them stay long there. I mean, if you let them go on for a few longer than uh, tens of milliseconds, I'm sure things will will get get bad. You know, there will be loss and so on. So the thermalization is only needed when you have five, six, seven collisions to thermalize, and then we move on. Okay, okay so I think uh, with that, we'll thank. June again for a really, a really exciting and fascinating talk. Thank you. And then um, I'm gonna, June, I'm gonna hijack the screen here. Um, I'm gonna stop so that I can advertise the upcoming talks. So um, next week, we believe that there's going to be, the quantum science seminar should be back from break, but they haven't posted their new schedule yet. So there's a tantalizing mystery talk, maybe next week for the quantum science seminar, stay tuned. If there is a talk, it'll be on Thursday at uh, five uh, Central European time. Uh, and then um, there, there will be a Vamos talk and we know what that's going to be. So that's Francesca Ferleno from Innsbruck. Uh, who'll be telling us about super solidity in the ultra cold when atoms behave as a crystal and superfluid at the same time. And so uh, if you do wanna chat with June or have any further questions or questions that we didn't manage to get to during the talk, you can join him in the post uh, seminar discussion. Um, and thank you, June, for participating in that. And the link to that should be in the uh, the Zoom webinar chat, in the YouTube chat, and also posted on our website if you have trouble finding it elsewhere. You can find it on the Vamos website. So uh, we hope to see you there. And thanks a lot. And otherwise, we'll see you next week. Thanks, June, again. Thank you.